Um, I'm Jake Olivier, the Vice President of the New South Wales Branch uh, Council. Um, I'm the outgoing Vice President, and the Lancaster Lecture is usually the, the last thing the outgoing President and VP does. Um, unfortunately, we, we were meant to do this back in March, but uh, the whole world went to went hell in a handbasket, I suppose. Uh, we tried to um, um, push this off as far as we could into the future, hoping that Thomas could give his talk uh, in person. Um, but as things have progressed, um, the pandemic hasn't relented and let us do this. So, so we're having a Lancaster lecture uh, in October of this year, instead of the usual March, which usually goes along with our um, our uh, a, uh, AGM. Okay. Now, uh, Thomas is our current president, and uh, he has been with us for a very long time on the New South Wales Council. Um, I'm not sure how many years he's been he's been with us. He's had various roles, including just a general counselor. He's been our secretary, which anyone would tell you is the most work of anybody on the council. Um, um, he he knows how the the council works through and through, and it's been great having him as president this year, and and he'll continue on into next year. Uh, Thomas is a senior lecturer at the, the the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at Macquarie. Um, he has I know he's had an interest in uh, generalized linear models and and things related to that for for quite a long time. Um, um, today he's going to be talking about uh, count data and um, I'll let him get to it. Thomas. All right, thank you, Jake. Um, just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Okay, I assume everyone say yes. Yes. Excellent. Finally, have some confirmation. Appreciate that. All right, so let me quickly switch over the slide. I'll come back to this slide um, near the end. Oops. Um, let me do the technical difficulties here. Okay. We're good to go. All right. Um, thank you, Jake, for very nice introductions. Um, it is absolutely um, such an honor to present this year's Lancaster Lectures. And but before we begin, um, in a spirit of uh, reconciliation, uh, reconciliation. The Statistical Australia um, acknowledges the traditional custodian of country for Australia and the connection to land, sea, and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and presence and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. And before we start on the formal part of the talk, so let me introduce by saying Happy World Statistics Day 2020. And I hope you have enjoyed all the activities that, that society has organized for you so far. And we do have some cracking um, activities that we all have yesterday, um, highlighted by the Queensland branch talk and also the Victoria branch of base lecture. And World Statistics Days, of course, is only happening once every year. So in that regard, um, may I wish all your data be tidy. And whatever questions or challenges you face they have with your data, there's always a stack overflow flows with great answers to solve them all for you. All right, so I'm gonna mute my video so I, my wee hand gestures won't annoy you. All right, so let's give you a little roadmap about what to expect in the next um, 14 minutes or so. Um, I'm gonna spend a little time talking about um, Professor H.O. Lancaster's, um, particularly what I, basically I mind most about this great statistician. And then the rest of the talk we're focusing on a few projects that related to modeling count data, um, which also sort of function around a few pack our packages that I'm working on. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about the man that we're here honoring today. Professor Lancaster, um, Henry Oliver Lancaster is a role model for many modern statisticians. And to honor his many achievements, um, the New South Wales branch of SSA um, started or commenced the Lancaster Lectures in 1979, which is like a meeting like today, which is a tradition of how basically over 40 years. 
And distinguished Professor Kerry Magerson gave an excellent Lancaster lecture last year, reflecting on Professor Lancaster's extensive research work, which culminates in his book, Expectation of Life. And if for some reason that you actually missed that excellent talk by Kerry, and if you're a member of us, you can actually relieve the whole lectures on the Statistical Society website. And once you log on as a member, you can find all the past seminars um, listed under the communication tab. And you can find um, carry excellent lectures together with Patty Wickham's um, public lecture on tidy data on there as well. It's one of the benefits that um, we offer to our members. And these two talks are undoubtedly some of the highlight for the branch activities last year. And also on the topic of for sharing video. Um, I've undoubtedly a lot of us actually not probably not aware of this. Um, the Statistical Society also have our own YouTube channel. They actually put um, some of our, our webinar on there. But based on the subscription numbers, our subscription numbers, you can see that it's not utilized as much as we hoped. Um, so I would like to make a part that actually everyone should go on the YouTube and search for Statistical Society Australia and click the subscribe button and the bell. So whenever the next video actually posts on YouTube, then you will among the first people to know. Sorry, I went off topic a little, but let's get back on point. And I'd like to use the, um, some of the time for this lecture to reflect on Professor Lancaster's contribution to the wider statistics community. So it's not focusing on his research work. And here I'm gonna list a few um, that make the biggest impressions on me. So Lancaster's actually has a lot of connection with the New South Wales branch. So let's reflect on a little bit histories of the society first. So Statistical Society of Australia initially found at the Statistical Society of New South Wales in 1947. Then a little bit later in 62, it joined forces with the Canberra branch at the time to create a national statistical society. So just want to have a show of hand um, that you should be able to find a sort of emotion button down at the bottom. So show of hand, metaphorically. Who, who here believes Professor Lancaster was our first ever president? Okay, there are some chats here. All right, so checkpoint now, there's actually no, no options in there. Um, so moving on, it turns out he's not. So the history of the time was that there was some extensive discussion between Stuart, Stuart uh, Waterford, um, Helen Newton Turner, and Professor Lancaster himself to explore ways to try to communicate with members of the statistics um, community. So, 12, so at the time, they've rung up 12 different people, all with different expertise, and basically formed the very first council of the Stats Society. And this 12 member structure is still retained in the New South Wales branch till today. And within that group, Helen Newton Turner was selected to be our first ever president. And for those that doesn't know her, um, for those that don't know her, she was the leading authority on sheep genetics and worked basically like a sorrow at the time. Um, for 40 years. But even Professor Lancaster wasn't our first president. Um, she still contributed to the society in many ways. She was the New South Wales branch president um, for, for two years, as well as become the national president um, for another two years as well. And Professor Lancaster was also involved in the founding of the Australian Mathematical Society and later served as a president, but that's probably a topic for another time. Given the aim of a society is to allow us to communicate with people in the same view, Professor Lancaster starts sending out monthly bulletins on newsletters at the time, which he edited himself. And 10 years later, it became so successful, the bulletin became the first published edition of the Australian Journal of Statistics, which is the current version, well, which later evolved into the Australian New Zealand Journal of Statistics. And he was served as editor of the journal till 1971, which is a very long time. 
So that's another things that he did. And another field that Professor Lancaster that what well, Excel was statistical bibliography. I actually have to read that sentence multiple uh, sentence multiple times to convince that this is something that Lancaster is really good at. It turns out in his um, great book, Expectation of Life, it alone has almost 90 pages long of bibliography and it's printed in two columns that estimated over 2,800 items. You have to remember that this was all done at the time without computers, without Google. To list over 2,800, about 2,800 bibliography is a lot of work using index card or basically using a paper trail. And you may argue that, well, this is like Professor Lancaster's sort of primary research work. So having extensive bibliography on that probably not a such a surprise. But he doesn't stop there. So even at the time, there's actually no formal database. It's actually very hard to pick out all the different references. So around 1960s, bibliographies on statistical or related topics start popping up. And so some of the academics start asking, well, could we actually have a bibliography on the bibliographies? And at the end, Professor Lancaster took that task on and he published this book, The Bibliography of Statistical Bibliographies in 1968. And then subsequent years also published an, oh, another 21 attender at the time. And I have a screen cap here for the eighth one, basically. So here I hope that you well, sort of understand that Professor Lancaster's not only do excellent research work, he also spent a lot of his time um, and doing work just for the statistical community. And for that, I think I'm really impressed by. Um, so at the end of this sort of all this research, one of the big questions I have in mind is that where did Professor Lancaster find all the time to do so much, so much great work? So I hope you now all have a deeper appreciation of Professor Lancaster's um, contribution to the wider community. So I think that's enough um, on the topic of Professor Lancaster. So let's talk a little bit about my own work. Before I start, I'd like to put in a little acknowledgement. Um, so this presentation presents some joint research with Dr. Alan Huang from University of Queensland, IL1 at Macquarie University, and also Justin Wishart, which previously part of the Macquarie University group and now are basically data scientists in this player. So first of the topic I'd like to touch on um, is the Conway Maxwell Poisson GLM. So you may ask, what is the Conway Maxwell Poisson distribution? So the Conway Maxwell Poisson distribution was first used by Conway and Maxwell in 1962 as a model for queuing system with dependent surface times. And a random variable is said to have this particular distribution with two different parameters. One is lambda, the other one for control the rate. The other one controlling the dispersion is called new. If this PMF actually have this particular form. So if you forget about this sort of fun function for a second, let's just focus on the functional form. You can see that this is pretty much like the Poisson. The only difference is that there's a power new um, in the denominator, well, in the factorial sign. Um, and this new allows you to control the dispersions of the distribution. And for the rest, this is just a normalizing constant. And one in very good properties of the CMP is that it has Poisson as special case, of course, if nu equal to one, and it also have a bridge or continuously between geometric um, to Bernoulli, depending how you set up the dispersion parameter. But this distribution hasn't actually caught on for a very long time. Uh, one of the primary reasons we think that it doesn't actually catch on, become way more popular until the current form, current days, is because it does not process closed form expression for its moments. So all we can do is basically shows that you have um, some sort of recursive formula. And more recently, back in 2005, um, Samuli and you know, um, actually start doing finding approximation for these sort of moments. And to show this. So from here, I want to like, make a few observations. One. The expected value of this distribution does not equal to the rate lambda. Okay, that's, that's very important to know. And secondly, is that um, the new, based on this approximation for the variance, you can definitely see that it control the whether distribution is over dispersed or under dispersed. 
So if when if nil is less than one, then the distribution is over dispersed. In reverse, CMP is under dispersed when nil equal to greater than one. And here's a plot of the density for few CMP distribution with mean equal to five. So in the middle of the plot, we have nil equal to one, which is exactly equal to Poisson. This is the equal dispersion case. When nil equal to 0 0.5, then the distribution is over dispersed as characterized by this very long tail to the right. And when nil is greater than one, in this case 1.5, the distribution is under dispersed. As you can see that the distribution is more concentrated um, around the mean five. So given that the distribution is one of the few options available that can handle both under and over dispersion, so the aim, or there's been some work to extend the GRM formulation to the CMP case, so that one can model the relationship between Y and some predictors. So Seller, or Kimberly Sellers and Simuli in 2010, and I must say, Kimberly is definitely the leading experts in this area, um, proposed a GRM for current response, Y that can be specified by this. So in other words, basically try to link the rate parameter with some of the covariates. And this structure is formed the basis on, well, basically two our packages. One, of course, produced by um, Kimberly Sellers and her group. And then there's also Pollock provided another package. This model, however, does not provide a close form relationship between the mean of the distribution and the linear predictor making it incompatible with other commonly used log linear model like the Poisson and the negative binomial, which we've been using extensively and basically fall in love with. And this is definitely more convenient to interpret um, in, or, and interpretable to model the mean of the distribution directly. So Ellen proposed to prioritize the distribution using this mean. And how, would, how are we gonna link the mean and the ray parameter together? We're gonna to basically solve the mean constraints um, all the time. And we'll use this notation CMP with subscript mu um, just to distinguish it from the original or the standard one. If we actually use this CMP mu distribution to set up the GLM, like so, um, then there's actually a lot of advantages over the original versions. So I'll hear at least a few of them. The GL, the GLM that actually based on this CMP mu distribution um, is a general GLM. So all the familiar key features of GLM are retained. It also makes it comparable and compatible with other commonly used log linear regression model for counts, such as the negative binomial distribution and also the Poisson. Another advantage of the, between the mu and the dispersion parameters is, are that they are orthogonal, making it similar in structures to the familiar negative binomial regression for over dispersed count. In contrast to the standard CMP, the rate lambda and dispersion nu in the standard CMP, they are not orthogonal. So what it means is that if you change one, it will greatly affect the other. And because we're setting up using the mean as the main parameter, it's very easy to incorporate offsets into the model. So work has been progressed to the point that um, it can be extended to allowing the dispersion parameter linked to some other um, covariates as well, but we're not gonna spend much time on this particular extension. So we're gonna stick with standard GLM for now. So when I start on to pick on this particular topic, um, it doesn't seem like, it seems like rather niche. But in the current day, um, it turns out we have a lot of competitions. So here I'm gonna list a few more. So we call that the, uh, the mean of the distribution can be approximated um, using this particular formula. Um, so Robinho in a group in Brazil actually proposed a slightly different prioritization, which arguably is slightly simpler because it doesn't actually you need to solve the mean constraints all the time. We're basically just trying to put the side on the other, well, basically solve this equation for lambda and, and use it as a first order approximation. And we'll denote this as the CMP approximate mean distribution. Okay, and this structure is from the own R package, um, which is CMP rec. But the problem with this prioritization is that when the estimated mean is so small, like this term, it really restricted how small nu can be so that lambda actually remain positive, which is a key requirement here. There's also another package, um, this 
this this time this is a group in Spain. Um, really a problem pronouncing what this acronym is supposed to be. Um, so it stands for Double Generalized Linear Models Extending Poisson. Um, so it's packaged by Cesc Costello, Condesentius, and also Martinez. So they use the, well, basically the nonlinear of R package of Yamaha 2007, which is the R interface to nonlinear op library to feed the mean parameterized model that um, Alan proposed. So in terms of theory, this package is basically using the same theoretical background as our own. So let's introduce our own, well, basically a fighter to the ring. So we basically write our own little package called MPCMP, which stands for mean parameterized CMP regression. We can actually use this to fit standard log linear regression. Um, there's also a bunch of other uh, subsidiary uh, function allows you to test data dispersion and also doing standard model diagnostics. I'm just going a little hand waving here. So the optimization is basically done a very simple visual scoring update. In terms of theory, that's really straightforward. Um, just to take advantage of the fact that the distribution belong to the exponential family. But all the key sort of important advance in this piece of work is that um, this is actually a constraint optimization because we have to solve the mean constraints every time we do an update. So it takes a sort of computational work to actually make it run efficiently. So the implementation in terms of the code actually be more challenging than some other one that actually just use uh, Optin. So let's tell you a little examples or motivating examples of tell you what our package can do. So here we refer to the constant over dispersion example, which we call attendance. Um, and this is a data set uh, examines the relationship between the number of days absent from school and the gender, math score, and also which academic programs that these students enrolled in from two urban high school. So here I have a little bar chart, um, a bar chart with the data set. So let's focus on the bottom row. Um, this is the data that actually have all the things in it. So you can see that this data has a very long tail to the right. Definitely indicator that the data is over dispersed. And if you actually go into different subgroups of the data and you can see that based on which program they enroll in, they definitely have slightly different pattern. For instance, that if you enroll in the general program, you, all the data basically shifts slightly to the right, indicating that students generally skip more classes or miss more classes if they enroll in the general program. So it's definitely something there that we should be explored using a generalized linear model. And that's basically what we do. So we're gonna feed three different models here for comparison. One is the standard CMP model. The other one is our proposed CMP mean parameterized model using our package. I'm also going to throw in the standard negative binomial model there just for reference. Okay, so let's, let's take a look comparison between the standard CMP and also negative binomial model. As I say from the beginning, um, CMP, the standard CMP does not actually behave like a standard log linear, uh, log linear model. So you can see the estimates actually comes out vastly different to the negative binomial, which we well, basically get used to. On the other hand, because we set up the CMP to behave more like a negative binomial, um, so the number we produce by the package will be more consistent with the log linear model that we all use regularly. So this basically shows that the MPCMP is directly comparable and uh, comparable with other commonly used models. So this also means that interpreting the parameters is relatively straightforward. So our model estimates that if students enroll in a general program, which is the reference level, then they're expected to miss basically 3.5 times more days of school compared to students in the vocational program. And such interpretation is actually a lot more complicated for the center CMP because it doesn't actually relate to the mean of the distribution directly. So all you can say is that if student enroll in a general program, it will, it will actually miss some, well, basically more days of school, but you actually can't quite really quantify it with the mean. So how about some of our competitors? 
So how about the one that would be a POC survey mean? If I actually try to fit that um, package with the, this particular attendance data, you basically get some error. So basically that doesn't quite work. One of the reasons we suspect that it actually is the case is because the, dis the dispersion in this case end up quite small. So remember that we have the approximation earlier that if the, actually the mean is small, then it really restricted how small new can be. And obviously this case actually break that barrier so the whole thing falls apart. So how about our competitors from Spain? Because we're putting so much work in, we're actually doing, uh, so basically what I did here, what we present the key is basically doing a little micro benchmark. I run the, well, a competitor from Spain package and also our own package according to the different data set. One is from the attendance data set that we just mentioned previously. And then I'm also gonna talk, um, and then there's another one which is under this post that I'm gonna mention briefly later. But in both of these package, for both of these tests, one basically repeat like 50 times, you can definitely see that our package or our own implementation is at least a few times better. And for those actually um, reading this graph correctly, basically the, the more to the left, um, the performance is better because basically take up less time to compute the estimation. So basically, in terms of the well, sort of mean implementation of the distribution, I think we have the best package. So let's tell you a little bit more about the package. We actually set it up in a way that no matter the syntax, the algorithm, and also all the functions that support it, actually make it almost like a standard GLM. So the main function from the package is called GLM.CMP. So the formula, everything else, it pretty much mean make the GLM uh, the negative binomial code. And even the output is, you can see that it's very similar. And because we, use it, we set up the distribution using a GLM, so it also make it possible to provide a range of diagnostic plot that comes with our package. So you can actually all the diagnostic stuff you do for GOM, um, our package will also provide it together with a few additional ones. Um, particularly, we are very fond of using the PIT, which stands for probability integral transform. Um, essentially, this goes back to second year probability that if you plug a random variable into its own CDF, it basically transforms to the uniform distribution. Obviously, there's a little bit more tricks because um, the distribution is discrete, but there are some tricks in the literature to help us actually breach that gap. Of course, one of them is what we call the randomized um, PEATs, which I think David Wharton um, do a lot of work on. Um, but here I, pre I present the one that is non-randomized, but the randomized one is also in the package as well. And then there's also the sort of standard things like residue versus speed the pots and also the coke distance and lab rates, they're all in there. Although it seems like what you expect from a GLM package, but I have to state very clearly that most of competitors doesn't even do diagnostic plot. And the more recent um, release on Crank, um, the package also support broom tidy and methods now. Uh, so this means the package can take advantage of any enhancements um, that use broom, such as the model summary package. So it's a very neat way to present all the data um, for your report. And, um, and the main reason why I want to print this out is that, well, marginally, uh, the CMP distribution actually is the best fitting model out of the, out of the three when compared with POSOL and the negative binomial. All right, I'm skipping the slides on different methods. Um, I'll put the slides on the GitHub page later. So if you want the more details about the work we do, you can always go on there and look. And I want to spend a little time talking about under dispersion. Um, and because this is one of the things that not many packages or not many distribution can do. And credit is credit is due. Um, I got an excellent question from Han Lin. I think he's in the audience today. Um, asking about where's the under dispersion come from? So obviously under dispersion is a lot rarer than over dispersed because over dispersed you can actually generate it from 
the Poisson distribution using some sort of mixture. Um, and the common theory so far is that under dispersion usually well, can occur um, when you have some underlying factor that you're not accounted for that actually make the response negatively correlated. Um, so therefore, that could contract the variance between them. Another possible way to get under dispersion is do a little subsampling, or what we basically call, call p thinning. But if the p thinning or the subsampling process is depending on the rate of the Poisson, then you can also get under dispersion. But let's get back to the examples at hand. So this is an example to talk a little bit about the number of bits, minus one, so let's start from zero, that received by 126 US firms. There was a successful target of tender offer during the period 1978 to 85. And the data set come with a set of exponential variant variables such as um, what sort of defensive action they did, some firm specific characteristics such as the size and size square, and whether federal regulators actually step in and stop it. So if we actually feed this data set with our package, it estimated um, U is 1.75. So that's definitely indicated of under dispersion. And if we actually fit it into one of the functions, you can also test it whether there's a chance that this has happened. Well, this number 1.75 is occurred by chance. Um, if you read it, run it through with an likely ratio test, it actually shows you that that's very unlikely that, um, so very unlikely that this has occurred by chance. Therefore indicating there may be strong indications of un un under dispersion. So I also want to show you the comparison between side by side of the distribution of the, the one for phase five package and also the Poisson, because this is the equal dispersion case. Um, the idea of using the correct distribution is that in the, in the under dispersion case, your standard deviation estimate here actually generally is a little bit smaller. And that usually has an impact or have basically having a correct standard error estimate generally has the impact or have basically do a correct inference. And for instance, in this particular one, like the size, actually flip the uh, well, sort of change from having a smaller p, well, basically a p value drop below 5% against that when your Poisson is actually over. So we we'll also definitely have an impact on what the confidence interval is gonna look like and they may actually impact your decision. And of course that the using the CMP definitely make it fit better as well. Okay, so before I move on to something else, so let's give you a little recap. So if you ever consider using a CMP, but unsure on which package you should use, just remember to use the one that is mean. And you can find the package on Crank, uh, this available on Crank now, as well as on my GitHub page for the developer version. And of course, a thank you for all the cooperator, um, Aya, Justin, and Alan to actually put this package together. And after this project, of course, that we're interested in see what other things we can use this situation to do. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I'll try to use it in some other area. Um, and here we're trying to use this as the, basically like kernel smoother. Um, this represents some joint work with Alan again um, and his students in University of Queensland. So suppose we have some count data, which is generated using the standard still inflated Poisson where the Poisson rate is 10 and then there's like a 7% chance to have pure zeros. And then gen after generate the data and pull histogram, this is what we got. Obviously that using this histogram is definitely one of the estimator we can do to estimate the correct underlying PMF. But there are some undesirable properties if we just do that. For instance, that's usually, if, whenever the sample size is not large enough, generally there are gonna be some gap in the bar chart histogram here. And also because if you're using empirical distribution, then you can never actually estimate the tail uh, when it's be beyond the observed range. So one way to get around this problem is to use some sort of kernel estimator. And obviously in the literature, continuous distribution such as the normal has been used extensively as a smoother, but discrete distribution on the other hand has not been explored as much. So in this little project, we use the distribution to create consistent second order discrete associated kernel. 
And the uh, CMP mu distribution is great um, for this sort of application for, for a few reasons. One is that the distribution can be arbitrary under disperse, essentially to make it very condensed um, or compact, which is the key to containing consistency as the sample size increases. Another great feature of the CMP mu distribution is that the two parameters, the mu and the dispersion mu, they are orthogonal. So basically, it makes it behave very similar to the normal distribution and its two parameters, mu and sigma, as well. And you've actually used it as some sort of kernel estimator. Um, we call this method the compact smoother. And because I don't have a lot of time today, so I'm basically just going to show you the results. Um, so this is the, the same data as before, but the red bar is the feed from the compact smoother. And obviously, you will be interested in what sort of bandwidth estimator we have. Um, in the package, we implemented two ways. One is using compact library distance, and there's also a way to use course validation as well. So currently, this paper um, is available as a preprint. Uh, you can find it on our archive server. And the development version of the software is also on my GitHub page. All right, let's check the time and see how we're doing. OK, have another 10 minutes. So let's see if we can finish this. So the final topic I want to cover today is a serial failure Poisson. So in many countdown processes, serial observations occur more frequently than expected from a normal distribution. And obviously, the classic, the original serial failure Poisson Lambert is widely used to model this. Why so popular is because um, it offers a very general uh, or intuitive mechanism to explain why the extra zeros. It's basically break down into two components. One is the Bononi with some probability pi of being just generating zero, and also a Poisson with some rate. And then a, C, then a SIP basically just multiply two together and get the sort of familiar SIP density. So that from there, when you calculate, you get the mean and also the variance, which we all know. So I'll talk about why the SIP is at, um, so advantage, but it also has sort of some constant, well, sort of non, a little bit undesirable properties as well. So the regression and time series model of the mean of the Y can only be identified to the product between the one minus pi and lambda on the classical SIP. So which means that the goodness of fit of SIP model depends crucially on the individual model for pi and lambda separately, but this cannot be easy to check as neither process is fully observed. So we're going to propose key and alternative. So we're going to start off with the dent of the mass function of any SIP of the SIP distribution, and we're going to construct a new family of distribution using exponential tilting. It's basically multiply the SIP density using this particular exponential function and try to normalize it. And what's interesting here is that this operation is closed. Um, so therefore, no matter how much tilting you do, it basically just gives you another SIP distribution with a new um, serial inflation factor and also a new rate. But this also, because this is close, it, in other words, it doesn't matter what lambda to be. So therefore, we can always set up to one, and then we can simply interpret pi um, as a baseline serial inflation rate relative to the standard Poisson on one distribution. And for mathematical conveniences, um, and also because of suggestion of a referee, um, we are going to use the baseline odds um, instead of the, the baseline proportion. And similar to the CMP that we proposed earlier, we always prefer to parameterize the distribution with the mean. So we're going to set mu to replace this sort of combination of parameters. And then we're going to denote this distribution as the CMP with subscript new and also parameter mu. Because we're doing parameterize so many different ways, um, so there's a bit of mass involved. I'm just showing you this. Um, but basically, after sort of this calculation, then we can do the reparameterization. And we're going to show you a little bit about the PMF of the SIPT. Um, so from the top row, this is what happened when mu equal to zero. So these are all the standard Poisson with mean two, four, and six. And then as you go down on different rows, the serial inflation factor increases. So starting from the left-hand side of your screen, you start from mu equal to two, and you can see that as mu increases, 
um, the seal inflation factor increases. But you can see that, also see that when mu increases, the seal inflation factor is not as prominent. Okay, go on. the reason for that is because this new is re referenced to when mu equal to one. So in other words, as mu increases, the zero inflation factor will basically like a dampen thing. But you can always ramp up to a higher number if you want a bigger zero inflation factor in the end distribution. And of course, that why we're doing all this is because we really like GLM. So the end game here is to use that as a GLM. And this should be considered as a zero inflator analog to the log linear negative binomial and also CMP models for this burst count. So what we really want to do is to let the mu parameter link to some sort of parameters. So let's show you an example on what we're doing here. So this data set is well, sort of the classic. So this is the biochemist. Sorry, I think I missed an S here. This is a biochemist data set. So the data set contains a number of articles produced by 915 graduate students in biochemistry during the last three years of the PhD. And, and the data set along with some information on the graduates, such as gender, marital status, the number of kids under five, how prestigious the department is, and what is the mental publication record. And it turns out that for now, how prestigious the department is doesn't we really, is not important whatsoever. So it has been removed from all of the well, all of the calculation after. And we're gonna feed the classical SIP using the seal inflation um, function in a PSCL package as well as the one provided by our own algorithm. So this is the output of our result. So from the standard sieve, of course, we have two different components. One is Poisson, one is controlling the serial inflation. And on the other hand, our own proposal only have one set of equations. So in here, we want to do a little model selections. Um, it depends on what your view is. Um, so the one that we highlighted, the highlighted at the moment, these are the one that if you actually do a formal model selection, um, you retain all these um, coefficients. But you can also, I think, but we think we can also make the case that because, um, well, they actually important in the Poisson, you may want to keep it in both components as well. So actually presented um, the selection result on both sides. So, so so the black one means that keep everything in there and the highlighted one is what happens if you only keep the one that's highlighted. Um, you can see that if you actually do the proper model selection, um, the seed model turns out to be a little bit better than our own proposals, but that's not a surprise because we do, well, our model is actually a little bit more restricted. So in this case, the seed actually feed a little bit better than us. But the main advantage or the main differences between the two model is in its interpretation. So let's focus on one of the covariates, say in this case is the one to tell you how many kids they have um, under the age of five. So for the classical serial inflator Poisson model, model interpretation requires two different steps. So we usually start with the Bononi component. So for each additional kid under five years, five years old, is associated with an increase in the log odds that in being in a population that did not have the opportunity to produce a paper, um, by increasing of 24% in odds. And then secondly, given a graduate is in the other subpopulation that do have the opportunity to produce paper, then each additional case under five years old is associated with a decrease in the expected number of paper by a factor of 0.87, therefore 13% increase. In contrast, the model interpretation for our own proposed model is much more direct. So the effect of each additional kid under five years old is a multiplicative factors of 0.82, so which means about an 18% decrease um, to the mean number of paper produced. And this value already adjusted for zero inflation. So one of the reasons why the SIP is so popular as mentioned before is because it can produce explicit pro uh, prediction for um, observation that end up in a subpopulation that only generates zero. But to this fact, I want you to take a look at the estimates. So if you compare the signs from the Poisson component and also the uh, um, Bologna component, 
all variables with the positive on one side turns out to be negative and vice versa. So in other words, as the expected number of paper produced increase, the probability of being in the do not have the opportunity to write a paper group tends to decrease and vice versa. So you have actually plot this out. You can see that there's a strong negative relationship there. To provide um, a clear example of how constant zero inflation can be unrealistic in practice. But this is the assumption using some time series model account, which we don't have the time to go through today. So, but if we actually want to do the, but our package or the algorithm can also produce these uh, feeds. So on the left-hand side, we have the estimated log odd for our package and also the estimate from the existing SIP algorithm. Um, there's generally some sort of positive um, or general alignment between the two estimates. If you want to do the marginal mean between the two methods, you can also see there's some um, positivity or linear relationship between them. Also that, of course, it tells off a little bit. But because we set up our distribution as a um, GOM, um, you can actually do all sorts of things that you expect from a GOM as well, such as um, the P that we have all earlier. You can also do randomized quantile residue, um, just like any other GAM as well. So this is the advantage of, well, we believe a little advantage um, to sacrifice a little goodness of it to actually gain those abilities. So as a result, we propose a model handle the serial inflation here without the need to specify an explicit model for the serial inflation process. And by in exchange for some goodness of it, we gain the interpretability, or basically make it easier, and also carry actual diagnostic tests over the standard seed model. And I think this is almost at my time. So I would like to use this opportunity, hang on. Um, I'd like to use this opportunity to Bang a few people before um, Jake take over. I'd like to hear to thanks um, my families and friends. Um, and without all of your support, and this academic journey is actually make it almost impossible. Um, and of course, we have a wonderful colleagues at Macquarie that's in the bottom left hand corner. Um, and also lives hands and a few friends, Jahendra, Ellen, Justin, and a model Calvins um, for the companionships. And of course, Ellen and um, Francis down at the bottom. Um, we also have um, Sam in the bottom right-hand corner and Garth as well. And thank you for all your advice and companionship over the years. And we'll also like to thank our academic parents um, with Neville and also Professor Senator. Um, actually provide all the, well, basically, teach me everything I know in statistics and also provide all the um, mentorship over the years. And finally, I'd also like to thank Jake um, and Amy, um, basically got me into this role. Um, and of course, Boris as well. Um, thank you for all the inspiration and leaderships over the years. Um, I hope that um, the Stats Society is in a good hand while we're moving forward. And finally, um, we, this job is almost impossible without a very good team behind me. So I'd like to hear to thank you everyone on the council this year. Um, I'm very sorry that I don't actually have a group photos for all of us um, because I'm not allowed yet. Um, so we'll, um, so I think the first order that, well, from a president point of view, the first order of business when we're actually able to see each other is to do a very, very good photo so we can put it on the website and show, up, show you all off. Um, so I think that's all my time. So at the end, this is just a list of references. Um, and I'll promise to put this slides on my GitHub page. And I'm pretty sure that this lecture is also recorded. Um, so if you're members, you can always go on the step website to check out all the details.